Energy prices have hit record highs in Europe. Many families are struggling to pay their power bills. It's triggered protests and even crisis meetings of EU leaders. So what's causing the power crunch? And is the bloc's push for renewable energy to blame? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Darren Jordan. Europe is facing a worsening energy crisis ahead of winter. Gas prices have reached record highs and supplies are running low across the bloc. Well, around the world, demand for natural gas and oil is up as economies reopen after COVID-19 lockdowns. Europe has about three quarters of its gas in storage, much lower than normal for this time of the year. Power bills are already going up. Italians have been told to expect a 40% increase over the next few months. EU finance ministers are demanding coordinated action to secure supplies. The European Commission president says the crisis shows the bloc needs to reduce its reliance on fossil fuels and invest in green energy. It is a serious issue. I think we have to be very clear that the gas prices are skyrocketing, and, uh, but the renewables, um, the prices have um, decreased over the last years and are stable. So for us, it's very clear that uh, with energy in the long term, um, it is important to invest in renewables. That gives us stable prices and more independence because gas is imported, 90% of the gas is imported to the European Union. Well, Europe relies on Russia for much of its natural gas. President Vladimir Putin is boosting supplies through Ukraine, but he says the EU can only blame itself for what he calls the bloc's hysterical push for renewables. The transition to green energy should happen smoothly, and our country definitely has all the possibilities to avoid those mistakes. We can see where unbalanced decisions, unbalanced actions and abrupt movements can bring us. Today, as I said before, we can clearly see it on the European energy markets. So let's bring in our guests. In Bern, Switzerland, economist Cornelia Meyer. In Berlin, Andreas Goldthau, professor of public policy at the University of Erfurt. And in Brussels, Silvia Pastorelli, a Greenpeace EU climate and energy campaigner. Welcome all to the programme. Uh, Cornelia Meyer uh, in Bern, let me start with you first, if I may. I mean, many analysts are saying that this energy crisis is a perfect storm of a number of factors. What do you think is behind the crisis and how bad is it? Well, it is a perfect storm of a number of factors. What's behind it is that, um, especially when you look at gas um, uh, and, and maybe also at coal, storage is as, as low as it's been in, in, in more than a decade, simply because we had a very, very cold winter last year. And then we have, you know, we have the, the shenanigans between Europe and um, Russia on gas and politics. And obviously, we also have climate change to deal with. And we all, we all, everybody, including myself, we want to achieve the Paris climate change goals. But to get from here to there, we still need investment in transitional fuels like gas. And that's hard to come by with. So people are not investing. Um, the weather is getting cold. So we are in a perfect storm of prices skyrocketing. And um, the economy is also recovering okay. from pa past COVID. Uh, Silvia Pastorelli uh, in Brussels. I mean, what's your take on this crisis? Then? I mean, surely the experts should have seen this coming. Well, uh, many people have also said that this crisis is linked to uh, renewables, to the energy transition. Um, but actually, it's quite the opposite, because uh, if anything, it's because the transition hasn't come uh, fast enough. And the crisis uh, is linked to our over-reliance uh, on gas. So the problem here is that we have uh, um, a lot of renewable energy online, but actually still uh, gas is the highest bidder on the market, which is actually dictating the prices and it's uh, it's what making uh, people feel the feel the energy uh, crisis in uh, very personally so let's just stay with that issue of the renewables for a second and bring us Andreas Goldthau. Uh, Andreas, if the EU's green transition is still in its early stages which is what the experts are telling us is there an argument here Andreas that the process isn't fast enough and we need to speed up infrastructure and supply 
Well, you can't go fast enough, really, right? Uh, in order to fight the climate crisis, you got to go with you know full speed and do everything that you can. Uh, but I would still say that um, the European Union is is going the right way with um, the European Green Deal and and with the various policies uh, you know towards decarbonization. If you just think about it, I mean, uh, after 2030, we're essentially phasing out fossil fuels. Uh, we're we might we keep gas for a little bit, but not for long. All oil is going to be gone for a very uh, after a short time, and 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 coal is going to be phased out in most of the countries within the next decade. So uh, it's, it's not going fast enough, but it is certainly picking up speed. Um, Cornelia Mayer, uh, is this current crisis, do you think, going to derail the transition to green energy? And, and also, was the time frame for this transition just too unrealistic anyway? Well, some people would argue the time frame was too realistic. Others would say it's going too slow. But I think what we just need to make sure, you know, there is the energy transition and there's the climate crisis, which we all agree with, but there's also a social crisis. So, so we need to make sure that in that transition, there will be enough energy delivered from relatively clean sources of fossil fuels, which we still need until we have all that, all that infrastructure invested in, in, in um, for renewables. Um, so we need to still make sure that the lights don't go out because what's happening now is, yes, we have a climate crisis, but at this point we, have, we may face a very urgent social crisis where a lot of people with lower incomes may need to decide between heat or food, and that is not acceptable. Yeah, and we'll come back to the issue of vulnerable people a little bit later in the programme. Silvia, let me come back to you. I mean, how much then uh, does this current energy crisis in Europe bring the EU's green transition under fresh scrutiny, and what does this mean then for its climate policy overall? Well, one thing that we know for sure is that, uh, as uh, as others on the program have already said, the EU is uh, the EU is going in the right direction, and this is this is obviously very good. Uh, but at the same time, we know that the targets and the policies that uh, the EU is putting in place under the big umbrella of the Green Deal um, are not fast enough and are not sufficient. They do not match. Uh, they do not match neither the urgency of the climate crisis uh, nor what scientists are telling us that we should be doing. There has been huge consensus around uh, the causes of uh, our changing climate and also on the policy measures that we should be adopting. And this consensus has been there for decades. The problem here is that um, for the moment where it's not, uh, it's not enough, uh, it's too little. We, what we, it's really important is that we also make sure that it's not too late. All right, so, so Andreas, I mean, you know, we're told that natural gas uh, and coal still supply more than something like 35% of the EU's total. What role, then, does natural gas play as a transitional resource uh, to bridge that gap to renewables? Well, natural gas has been called a transition fuel, but as far as I'm concerned, um, and, or as a bridge fuel, but as, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's not a very long bridge, really. Uh, you know, we, we will need gas uh, for the next decade or so. Um, and we cannot phase it out immediately for a number of reasons. By the way, also in, in including contractual reasons. We're, we're still, Europe is still tied into long-term contracts, which you cannot just leave. Um, otherwise, it would be pretty costly. But, um, uh, but natural gas will also uh, pretty much give way to renewables as of 2030. And that's maybe not tomorrow, but it's within less than a decade. Uh, and then it's going to be, be pretty quick. Uh, we're going to um, uh, phase in uh, and blend in renewable fuels uh, in, in the shape of renewable gases, power to X technologies, green hydrogen, these kind of things that will sooner or later also eat into the margin of natural gas in the hard to decarbonize sectors, such as aluminum, steel, the heavy industries. We're talking about green steel these days already, and that's precisely where a lot of gas will be still needed for the next decade, but not much longer. All right, so, Andreas, you seem quite optimistic about the transition itself. I mean, Cornelia, if renewables then are not sufficient yet to dampen demand, do we need to face this harsh reality, I guess, that, that, that coal uh, and dirty energy will be with us for some time to come to fill that energy gap? I think, yes, we do. And the, 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 the matter here is to make sure that there's as little coal as, as possible and as much of the cleaner fuel, which is gas, as possible. 
But you know, there is such enormous, enormous investment required to get from here to net zero. And we all, again, we all want to go to net zero, but there's enormous investment required. So in the meantime, we need to make sure we transition so that the lights don't go out and the socially vulnerable don't suffer. Um, Andreas, let me just um, uh, touch on the issue of how you think Russia views this energy crisis. I mean, we saw a quote earlier on uh, from the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Uh, I mean, the fact is Europe does depend on Moscow for much of its gas, but is Russia using the crisis for geopolitical leverage? I mean, it wants to get Nord Stream 2 up and running anyway, doesn't it? Well, you're, you're touching on a, on a very important point here. Uh, I mean, if you just stick to the formalities, the Russians haven't done anything wrong. They have uh, supplied the contracts that they're supposed to supply. Uh, the problem is they haven't done much more. So typically over summer, uh, what Gazprom does is they refill the storage in Europe. Uh, and for that, they book a lot of additional capacity in, in the transit pipelines uh, through Ukraine and, and other countries. And they haven't done this, which means we're now at, what, 76% or so of, of storage being filled up. And that compares to about 90% um, of uh, on average that we typically have, have in every year, uh, which means now the Russians are using this to make um, the case for supply security being ensured by way of bringing online Nord Stream 2, their new pipeline, and uh, uh, which is a pipeline that's there. It's, been com it's completed, uh, but it is, it is not operational yet. So the Russians are now essentially suggesting imp implicitly and more and more explicitly that uh, in order to avoid a supply crunch the upcoming winter, you better make sure the European regulatory authorities, in that case, the German regulatory authorities, better make sure that pipeline becomes operational rather soon. Make of it what you want. It certainly is about geopolitics. Uh, it is not necessarily about market behavior. Yeah, that's an interesting point you make. Um, Silvia Pastorelli, uh, an interesting quote from the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, blaming the crisis on the EU's what he called hysteria over transitioning to green energy. Presumably, uh, Putin doesn't want to see a quick transition uh, to renewables as he makes more money with natural gas. Well, as I was saying earlier, um, it has actually nothing to do with, uh, with the transition to, uh, to a renewable energy system. If anything, the problem is actually the opposite because we do not have, um, we have we're not transitioning fast enough and it's the over-reliance on gas and gas infrastructure that has put us in the situation. And uh, the more money we will keep pouring into, into fossil fuels, uh, the more likely we are to face uh, this kind of crisis in the future. And uh, it's, uh, it's really important and that we really move the investments in, uh, in a different direction. And uh, here it's where I would like to differ a little bit from what Cornelia was saying earlier. Uh, it's very important that we send this very strong signal that fossil fuel subsidies need to end and need to be phased out very fast because, as we all know, um, resources of all kinds, the economic resources either, they're not an infinite pie that can be divided forever. And uh, it's really important for the market to see as well where the, uh, where the resources should be put in and uh, fossil fuel subsidies need to be phased out and this money needs to be put into um, renewables but also into storage, into batteries, into interconnections um, and so on and so forth. So this, I think, is, uh, is really of primary importance right now. Uh, let me just get a quick uh, response from Cornelia uh, uh, about the Russian aspect uh, before we move the debate on. I mean, Russia uh, is suspected of slowing down its existing gas supplies, although it's just come out and said, no, that's not the case. Uh, is Europe playing politics with Russia or vice versa or both? I think they're both playing politics with each other. You know, the relationship between Europe and Russia is not a happy one. The relationship between Russia and many of the other, the Western world is not a happy one. So they're playing politics with each other. And, um, and, and, and yes, certainly there's an element of, of Russia playing politics, but there's also an element of a lot of money having been invested in Nord Stream 2, not just from the Russian side, from the European side as well. Uh, but really coming back to the renewables, we are all investing in renewables. And if you look at the strong ESG guidelines, it's very hard for banks, let's say, this time to um, invest in upstream developments of oil and gas. So, so the money is flowing in the right direction and it should flow in that direction. We just need to make sure we get over that hump. And we also need to get a little bit 
Western Europe centric, less Western Europe centric, because when you then go to, you know, Africa and other places where people need mobility, they may not have the money to invest in all that um, electric vehicle infrastructure. So we need to make sure we we keep the weaker still electrified and powered whilst we move on at fast speed towards energy transition. Andreas, let's just move the uh, debate on quickly and talk about um, emissions. I mean, what impact do you think the energy crisis then uh, will have on EU emission commitments? I mean, if renewables aren't fast enough and coal and gas, as you say, are plugging the gap, how is that likely then to play out at next month's COP26 in Glasgow? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd say, you know, the, the current crunch that we're talking about is... I mean, it is, it is not great and it's difficult and it will affect the most vulnerable people across Europe and elsewhere. But I would still say it's temporary. Uh, it is something that will go away after you know, a couple of months um, when the markets uh, will change again, well, when we're gonna have a, a softer market. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we probably don't have a lasting impact um, on, on gas markets and the en energy markets more generally. Uh, the, I mean, it's, it's hard to predict the future, but uh, what we have seen from the pandemic really is that uh, even a major, a major economic crisis does not put it, you know, does not do away with the structural realities of the energy markets, which are hardwired into energy infrastructure and long-term energy investment. So what you got to do is you got to put structural breaks into that system. And, and even a major, major crisis did not do that. Because what we've seen is that um, the, the the greenhouse gas emissions over 2019, uh, over 2020, they dipped considerably, but they picked up until the end of 2020, precisely to the levels where they have been before, and now they're picking up uh, again and, and above previous levels. So we haven't learned that lesson really. We haven't gone where we should have been, which is learn the lessons from 2008, 2009, when we. Um, had a huge dip in greenhouse gas emissions, but then it went all back to okay. normal. Um, we should have put the money more where, um, where climate policies are. Europeans did, the Europeans did, some other countries did not, so the US did not, the Chinese did not, and, and others didn't either. Um, which means overall, on a, you know, on a global scale, I'm, I'm almost pessimistic for, for this small crisis that we're seeing here having to have a, a lasting uh, effect in the All shape right. of putting structural breaks into let me Let me just uh, put that point then to Cornelia Mayer. I mean, Cornelia, what does this all mean then for the EU's climate commitments? Does this crisis put yet more pressure uh, on Europe's emissions? Well, I think that I think that Europe is very, very, um, very, very clear under the current guidance of Mrs. Van der Leyen that the, 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 the Green Deal is really, really important, and they want to they want to become the first uh, net zero continent in the world. So I think in COP they will really argue for 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 you know for for for, for going down the reality is how do we uh, again i'm a pragmatist how do we get from here to there yes we are pouring the investment in there and absolutely um you know uh, your other guest is, is is right that we are we are hardwired in a certain way but you know once investors have put a lot of money in something it's hard to 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 to, to go against that reality especially if you want them then to invest than something else, um, because they want to have some certainty of their in, of their investment. But if I look at the investment criteria, especially of major banks and of, of all the big, you know, um, um, asset managers, they are really driving towards net zero. So if anything, the oil and gas companies are seeing a very tough time getting money in. All right. So uh, we've looked at the picture in Europe. Let's look around the rest of the world, if we can, just briefly. I mean, with prices uh, for natural gas now reaching record levels, uh, Sylvia Pastorelli, what does this mean, do you think, for developing countries uh, who are struggling to restart their economies in a post-COVID world? I think here there's a few points that also have we have already quite touched upon in the conversation that are very important. First of all, is uh, um, is talking about the people who are most vulnerable, and we're talk we can we can talk about people who are most vulnerable both in Europe but also elsewhere. And uh, thinking about the the energy crisis and the price crisis right now, um, it's 
absolutely important that governments have in place plans for uh, those who are at most risk of, uh, of energy poverty. Uh, and I think this is a valid point in, in general, even beyond Europe as well. And, and second, uh, I think this is also even more crucial for uh, even for outside Europe, uh, the, the point of where we are signaling that the investment is worth making. And, uh, and this is why I was mentioning earlier the point of, around the fossil fuel subsidies uh, that need to be phased out because this continues to send the wrong signals mm. in Europe, but also elsewhere, because if we keep um, pouring money into, uh, you know, into the same, for instance, fossil gas infrastructure, we will only end up, okay. especially in the face of climate policies and climate crisis, we will only end up with stranded assets, and we're locking in more and more emissions. Uh, but this is a valid. This, I think this is valid for both Europe and uh, and outside. And as Europeans, I think this the COP is a perfect opportunity for okay. us to make sure that uh, that we provide support to those outside of Europe. Cornelia, I see you um, nodding your head there. I mean, we're already seeing rolling electricity blackouts uh, in China, energy companies going bust in the UK. Is this a warning, do you think, to the rest of the world? Well, it is a warning to the rest of the world. And I would especially look at the, at the developing world, because we need to make sure we help the developing world. I think Sylvia is absolutely right there. We need to make sure that we help the, the developing world with the, with the, the help of the COP, the, 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 the Paris Agreement, um, you know, funding mechanisms. Um, we, we help them invest in the right things. But we also need to make sure that we get over the hump, that the lights don't go out while we are doing all the right things. So we may need to live for a little while longer with, with the cleanest of the, of, the, of the fossil fuels to ensure that people still have mobility, have heating, have whatever they need. Yeah, Andreas, uh, let me ask you this. I mean, Sylvia touched on this issue of vulnerable people. Uh, I mean, many vulnerable people have already been hit by the economic impact globally uh, of coronavirus. Now they face spiraling energy bills. What does this mean then for ordinary people and what should governments be doing to help them? Um, well, governments can do a lot of things and we've just been through a major economic crisis. So most of the means that we have at our disposals, uh, disposal, they are tested uh, and, uh, and we know how they work. Uh, in the end, it can be anything from rebates to tax deductions to simply checks being sent out to people in vulnerable households. Uh, Probably um, some priorities need to be made, you know, to target, on the one hand, some of the industries that are important to keep and to keep running uh, because they also provide jobs for people. And on the other hand, to, to, to make sure the social impact of the current crisis uh, does not uh, adversely affect the most vulnerable. So there's some calibration to be done. But I think the other thing that, um, that we need to make sure is that um, we, in the end, start uh, saving energy. I mean, this is uh, the one thing yeah. uh, we cannot do now is tinker with the supply side. There is not going to be a lot of more gas coming along, nor can we just leave climate change policies and bring coal back in. So what you, what you otherwise, the, you know, the stringency of, stringency of, of climate policies okay. will be put in question. So what you got to do is you got to tinker with the demand side conservation measures are important here. And, uh, and then you probably got to pray a little bit okay. that we're going to have a mild winter. Cornelia, a final thought from you. Um, winter's fast approaching in the Northern Hemisphere. How do governments then help the most vulnerable in society? I mean, many people simply cannot afford to pay their energy bills. Yeah, and I think there they need to subsidise or they need to do however much we don't. I agree with Sylvia, we, sh we shouldn't subsidise anything. <laughs> but, but we may need to subsidise, we may need to give them transfer payments because we cannot, especially in Europe, in the developed, in the OECD world, we cannot ask people, pensioners, old people, weak people, ask to choose between food and heat. That's, that's just, that's not right. But I think we also need to look further. We need to look when we, we, we need to do um, energy conservation. Absolutely. That's the low hanging fruit. And we need to look at other technologies okay. when we produce energy okay. like CCUS and all the carbon capture usage and storage and all of those green hydrogen and all of those things. All right. We have to leave it there. Thank you very much to all our guests. Corny Lamea in Bern, uh, Andreas Golthau in Berlin and Silvia Pastorelli in Brussels. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. 
And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Darren Jordan, and the whole team here, goodbye for now.